The Aseki Madre House is currently located on the traditional homelands of the Tewa people in Santa Fe. Its traditional name is Ogepoge Owinge, or White Shell Water Place. The American West is a site of ongoing encounters among different kinds of people with different notions of home and family, different ways of thinking about property and resources, and differing histories. Outsiders have become insiders who then have questioned the authenticity of those who came after. There have been more wars of trade and conquest than we can count, most of them over who has the right to call certain places home. Women have often participated in these conflicts, but their stories remain untold. Eva Scott Fenyes, Leonora Scott Muse Curtin, and Leonora Francis Curtin Palohimo are three of these women. Claiming both New Mexico and California as home, these three built the Asequia Madre House determined to save precious places from the incursions, expropriations, and transformations of interlopers, people, ironically, much like themselves. Together, they developed passions for regional arts and culture and a collective genius for real estate development. In 1891, when Eva and her daughter Leonora first arrived in Santa Fe, there were few Anglo immigrants. But by the end of the 1890s, the railroads had spent millions advertising New Mexico to Eastern tourists. In the decade following World War I, hundreds of artists, writers, and visionaries, many from the East and most of them Anglos, journeyed to northern New Mexico to claim a home. Anglo women who defied convention in matters of love, family, career, and politics led the migration. Women like wealthy arts patron Mabel Dodge Lujan and the writer Mary Austin built pliable and expandable adobes to find an alternative way of life to the rigidity of Victorian houses that entombed male-headed nuclear families. Like them, Eva and the Leonoras would create a home in which women played the primary role in the transmission of property and family continuity. For Eva, Leonora Curtin and Leonora Francis, home was not a single building or even a particular city. Instead, they searched for the highest quality of life in the way others today might have a residence in Los Angeles or Dallas, a pied-à-terre in New York or Paris, and a trophy home in Aspen or Jackson Hole. In the process, they created and recreated their home as they moved from place to place, while also driving up property values. They returned often to New Mexico, where they nurtured friendships with a budding colony of writers, archaeologists, and artists, and soon were determined to build a house of their own. In 1922, Eva purchased land about one mile southeast of the Santa Fe Plaza, bordering the Aseque Madre, intending to build a house. She had already begun to invest in New Mexico, buying and selling commercial property to generate rental income. Aesthetes, artists, and patrons of the arts, Eva and the Leonoras were also savvy businesswomen who made shrewd investments in Western real estate. Four acres of their new parcel were reserved for the family's home. Four rental houses, two of them gift houses, to Leonora Curtin and Leonora Francis were planned for the remaining lots on land facing San Antonio Street. Over the next few years, Eva wrote letters to her husband, daughter, granddaughter, and secretary that were full of gossip and descriptions of social events, as well as the minutia of buying, selling, building, and managing personal and commercial properties in the Southwest. Land was a commodity for the women, and travel across land a regular luxury. Despite joining wholeheartedly in the embrace of a romanticized Spanish Pueblo past that has come to symbolize Santa Fe, Eva and the Leonoras were critical of the impact of tourism and commerce on the local landscape. In home building, the women reimagined their relationship to both the landscape and the complex history into which they had inserted themselves. Historian Flannery Burke has examined the ways in which the, quote, Anglo arts community recast the home as a wider space of New Mexico, end quote. Women like Eva, Leonora Curtin, and Leonora Francis appropriated and protected the Spanish Pueblo past they admired by using devices such as building permits, tax breaks, patronage, and preservation organizations. They brought the trappings of modernity to New Mexico, guided by a desire to save the remnants of what they defined as a simpler past from the ravages of the modern era. Engines of cultural hybridity, they acted in the name of preservation and they tended not to reflect on their own possession and expropriation of property, whether cultural or geographic. 
few Western transplants see the paradox of their own desire to then preserve culture. Those who are roughing it in wilder burbs or playing cowboy at ranchettes outside Missoula or Taos, or picking up squash blossom necklaces or leather cowboy hats in Santa Fe boutiques, want to consider themselves the shock troops of suburbia or perpetrators of the mauling of America. Small wonder, then, that earnest modernists like Eva and the Leonoras spent little time contemplating the ironies inherent in who they were and what they were doing. In part, Eva and the Leonora shared with other Anglo-Americans an impulse to glorify what Carrie McWilliams called the, quote, Spanish fantasy past, as they hired and oversaw, quote, local Mexicans as laborers and servants. Professing a vision of harmony with a timeless past, they overlook their own part as modern colonizers, perpetuating inequities that still exist today. Progressive, well-educated, and unconventional, they embraced a romantic vision of racial differences. Leonora Curtin deepened the family's connection to the American Southwest. She was a close friend of the archaeologist Edgar Lee Hewitt and the anthropologist Frederick Hodge, Mary Austin, and other promoters of Southwest regionalism. And she deserves inclusion among those who created what historian Chris Wilson has called the myth of Santa Fe. However, unlike Eva, whose philosophy was rooted in social and personal connections, Leonora Curtin worked to professionalize the study of the Southwest. She served on the Board of Regents for Santa Fe's Museum of New Mexico and on the Executive Board of the School of American Research, as well as the Board of Directors of the Southwest Museum of Los Angeles. She stood among the growing number of women crafting new public identities as interpreters of the American Southwest. Leonora discovered a fascination with plants and became a founder of the Santa Fe Garden Club in 1914. Not satisfied to remain a ladylike hobbyist, however passionate and civic-minded, she soon embarked on serious work in ethnobotany. She focused on medicinal plants and studied Spanish in order to interview curanderas. These are women healers in the villages of northern New Mexico. She worked closely with the California linguist and ethnologist John Harrington and approached both nature and culture as hybrid and historical. In 1931, she even traveled to Morocco with her daughter to investigate the Arabic roots of Spanish words she heard in New Mexico. In 1947, Leonora published Healing Herbs of the Upper Rio Grande, a book still in print. Her second book, By the Prophet of the Earth, published in 1949, was the product of four seasons of fieldwork with native informants among Arizona's Pima, now Akimel Odam tribe. She would visit Indian women's clubs every day with Elizabeth Hart, a U.S. government extension agent assigned to the reservation to teach sessions on home economics in hope of preserving their knowledge of native plants. Leonora traversed the countryside with Hart collecting plants and speaking to the women who attended these sessions. Leonora created a professional identity for herself and joined her mother and daughter in working toward the revival of regional crafts. At the time, Mary Austin and the artist writer Frank Applegate were leading an effort to revive craft work, and the three women quickly jumped on board. Eva saw the newly created Society for the Revival of Spanish Colonial Arts as an extension of her decades of collecting and philanthropy. Leonora Curtin and Leonora Francis would position themselves more visibly as experts and agents in the preservation of New Mexico's heritage. This preservation deepened their sense of connection to place. But what were they preserving? Why did it need to be preserved? What was lost? And who was making these judgments? The Anglo members of the society, incorporated as the Spanish Colonial Art Society in 1929, set out to, quote, save the disappearing craftsmanship of a Spanish past. As they approached the history of the region, they focused on a vision of humble villagers pursuing the arts of the home, rather than celebrating the epic achievements of conquistadors and missionaries. In 1926, the society organized a Spanish arts and crafts exhibition as part of the city's fiesta celebration. It also tried, with little success, to create a shop that would provide a retail outlet for the newly revived crafts. As Anglo men and women promoted the arts of New Mexico's Spanish and Mexican past, they engaged in paradoxical politics. Of course, they were sincerely enthusiastic about traditional crafts, 
but their paternalism ignored the ways in which the politics of Anglo-American conquest had long stunted the economic growth of New Mexico's rural villages. As patrons, they created new possibilities for craft workers, but at the same time, their promotion of pre-industrial culture invoked an Anglo fantasy of New Mexico's past. In the end, their efforts fell far short of fostering village prosperity. In 1932, two years after Eva's death, Leonora Curtin and Leonora Francis purchased El Rancho de las Golondrinas, an historic working ranch in La Cienega, 14 miles southwest of Santa Fe. Despite the onset of the Great Depression, they had continued to invest shrewdly in the stock market and had plowed their profits into real estate. During this period, New Mexico's villagers and farmers faced devastation. By 1933, one-third needed federal assistance for their survival. The Leonoras took advantage of the economic crisis. As the younger Leonora dispassionately observed, quote, land values had been brought down in New Mexico by years of drought and then were further lowered by the money crisis. This was a situation which seemed to offer many favorable opportunities, she said. In her history of La Loma, Leonora Francis wrote that ranching was not the only business in which she was embarked in 1932. There was also Native Market in Santa Fe. She had come to share her mother's and grandmother's passions for Spanish colonial culture and art and the vast desert landscape. She wrote in 1922, quote, I am just saturated with the glory of New Mexico and have no mental capacity for anything else. Oh, the infinite immensity and beauty of this magic land, end quote. By 1931, Leonora Francis was listed as a regular at the artistic and literary gatherings at George Park's New Mexican Cafe. She also became a talented linguist working with John Harrington to study and record the Navajo and Zuni languages. She would continue in the family tradition of combining business savvy with patronage to promote the folk arts of New Mexico. In 1934, Leonora Francis launched a store on West Palace Avenue in Santa Fe that would become known as Native Market. Reporter Ruth Laughlin of the Christian Science Monitor described Leonora's belief that, quote, the fine old examples of Spanish handicraft could be produced again in New Mexico if there was a market for them, end quote. Leonora wrote promotional brochures obscuring her own role as a middleman between the consumer and the indigenous craftsperson advertising Native Market's products as, quote, from village to market to you. Inside her store, tourists could meet villagers demonstrating their skill at metalwork, embroidery, spinning, and weaving. Whereas Austin and Applegate emphasized authenticity over marketing in their Spanish arts shop, Leonora placed profit potential on equal footing with craft revival, and she encouraged artists to interpret old designs for modern needs. The traditional crafts, she said, would have to leap from the 18th and 19th century into the 20th. At Native Market, women applied colcha, a traditional embroidery style brought by Spanish settlers to the northern frontier, to the decoration of modern accessories, such as throw pillows, purses, and curtain valances. Together, mother, daughter, and granddaughter created identities rooted in specific places. They maintained family bonds through writing, collecting, and preserving local histories and languages. They designed and built houses, speculating in and profiting from real estate, and created a legacy of local institutions out of their own homes. To emphasize one home over any of the others as primary or secondary disguises the women's mobility among multiple contested sites. Their very mobility both embodied and challenged regional cliches. As civic leaders in Pasadena and transient outsiders in Santa Fe, as adventuresses in Cairo and society women in the American West, as nurturers of regional artists in California and romantic patrons of Nuevo Mexicano craftspeople in New Mexico, and as astute businesswomen and devoted family members. To look at the multiple spaces inhabited by this extraordinary family expands our definition of home beyond domesticity to encompass the process of inhabiting places. Individually and together, Eva Scott Fenez, Leonora Scott Muse Curtin, and Leonora Frances Curtin Palojimo harnessed a particular alloy of sentiment and calculation. 
Their good intentions and big money subtly altered the chemistry of landscape and culture in the American Southwest. They profited from and protected the Spanish and native past they admired and founded. They funded and erected cultural institutions that directed the growth and identities of Pasadena and Santa Fe, two of the emblematic cities of the region. Working with one another and with like-minded friends and colleagues through the vehicles of real estate, tourism, art, and commerce, they were co-architects of the cultural landscape of the American Southwest though they were also emblems of the creative destructiveness of American capitalism, embracing tradition even as they embodied modernity. Today, the Aseque Madre House serves as the location for the Women's International Study Center and holds the collections and archives of the Fenias Curtin Palohimo legacy. The Women's International Study Center, or WISC, hosts fellows and residents working in arts, sciences, cultural preservation, and business. Fellows come from all over the world to work on projects and share them with the broader community. In keeping with the legacy of the three wise women, the Aseque Madre House continues to support contemporary artists through residencies, exhibitions, and interactive programming.